The following audio is from Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. I don't know about you, but after the sermon this morning, I'm surprised to see so many of you back tonight. (laughs) Uh, Not because it was bad, because it was so good. Um, I feel like we've eaten so well from the Word of God already today that it almost seems superfluous to meet again tonight and to do this. Um, When we were leaving this morning, there was a sweet couple in our church, and the man called me over and is like, you want to say something really important to me? And he said, "Um, that preacher is one of a kind, isn't he? (laughs) Yes, he is. Absolutely, he is one of a kind. And his wife didn't hear what he had said, and so I said, oh, he just told me that that preacher is one of a kind. And she was like, oh, oh, well, you're a good teacher. (laughs) <laughs> she's, like, she's like, I just don't want you to feel bad. I was like, I didn't until you just. <laughs> um, but no, this morning was, was a pleasure to listen to, to hear just of the grace of God and the greatness of his grace and our need of grace and how when we can um, just grasp what he's done for us and how much we need it and that the fact that Christ meets every need, that he meets us in our sin and he saves us And he calls us to something better. It's just such a great truth. And um, it it really is enough for today. It's enough for a week. It's enough for a lifetime. However, there is a lot of Bible here, right? I mean, the Bible is a very long book. Do you wonder why it's such a long book? Because we need a really long book, right? We need to be reminded of these truths over and over again. God is a great and vast and incredible God, and we are very forgetful people. And so what I hope to do tonight is just to, to draw your Attention to a passage that we can nibble on tonight, that we can taste, and to see once again how good God is. We'll be back in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4, this evening. If you remember last week, if you were here, we were in a very difficult passage. We were in a passage that, at least part of that passage, is very difficult to understand. Martin Luther is very quick, he's very quick-witted, and he was very sure of a lot of things. There were many things that he was willing to die for and to stand on. But when it came to this passage, the passage we looked at last week in 1 Peter chapter 3, he said, a wonderful text is this, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament, so that I do not know for a certainty just what Peter means. (laughs) So, So Martin Luther was able to look at the text and say, it's great, it's good, it's from God, but I have no idea what it means. And I think that's a little bit of what we did last week. (laughs) However, we found that surrounding the confusion, surrounding the part that we're just not sure of, and there's different ways to interpret it, and they're all great, we saw a few truths very clearly. The first truth is that Christ suffered and died in the place of sinners to bring us to God. This is the the penal substitutionary atonement. This is how we as believers look at the cross, that Christ died in our place, that the wrath of God that we deserved was poured on his head, and he did it so that we could be brought to God. It is the only way that we can be brought to God, to be made right with God. So we saw that very clearly, and we saw Christ suffering very clearly, but then in verse 22, we saw very clearly that now Christ is not suffering that he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God, that he's now in glory. And that was an example for us in itself, that there is suffering, and it can be excruciating for a time period, that we are going to encounter trouble in this life, but there is an end to that trouble, and after the suffering, there's glory. And so that was a great truth for us last week. We're going to begin in chapter 4, verses 1 this evening. And we looked at verses 1 and 2 last week. But I think 1 and 2 are connected to verses um, 3 to 6. So hopefully we'll look at verse 1 and 2 again, just to be reminded of what's there, and then go on to verse 4 to 6 this evening. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Christ has suffered. So Peter says, arm yourselves or prepare yourselves for battle with the same mind, with the same attitude, with the same readiness and willingness. 
we as believers should look to our Savior and say, this is what he did because of sin. Now I'm going to go into this world and be ready to suffer like he did. I'm going to ready myself for it. And then he goes on, he says that, that when we've done that, when we do that, we've ceased from sin. I think this is just a great reminder that when we enter suffering, when we encounter suffering, it is one of the best ways for us to draw our attention away from what's temporary and on to what's eternal. We encounter suffering, and all of a sudden, those fleshly lusts that are so quick, and they, they drive us, and they control us, but they're fleeting, and they're empty. Those things are pushed aside when, there's, when we encounter suffering. Oftentimes, it's at times when we're suffering that we realize what's important. Now, there's an artist named Stephen Curtis Chapman, and he's written many songs. You've probably heard a lot of the songs he's written. But the truth is, I had... I mean, I, he's, he's fine, his words are good, but I've never really found his music as compelling until he suffered a great loss. He suffered the loss of his adopted daughter. And they went through that, and he wrote a CD, and that CD is all about him struggling in the temporal, struggling in this life, but then looking to God and looking to heaven and looking to eternity to find comfort and grace and strength. And I think that's just a great example of what suffering can do. It gets us off of what's temporary and onto what really matters, what's eternal. That is what the believer must struggle to do all the time. It's a constant battle for us to stop looking at what's in front of us every single day and to keep our eyes on Christ and to keep our eyes on eternal things. We are commanded to do that. And so he says, don't use the time you have to live out your own will or the will of the Gentiles. Don't use this time to just do whatever you want to fall into whatever sins your flesh craves and what you desire, live this time, this short period of time you have for the will of God. He goes on in verse 3, and he helps us understand what that means. He says in verse 3, for the time past of our life may suffice us or is sufficient. So what, what we've already gone through, the time that we've already wasted is sufficient to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Peter says, haven't we wasted enough time? Haven't you in your life as you sit today say, I've wasted enough time on sin. I've spent enough of my days worrying about myself and what my flesh wants to do and feeding myself in whatever way possible. Haven't you thought enough about that? Has that ever satisfied? Has it ever, has the promises ever been fulfilled? No. We've wasted enough time. He says our attitudes and our driving motivations must change. Our actions with others must change. Our religion must change. Those are the, those are the things he's pointing to, right? He walked in lasciviousness, or this is this is sensuality. We've walked in lust, in excess of wine, in revelings. A lot of translations say orgies, banquetings, or these, um, these riotous parties. Haven't we wasted enough time with those things? Just, just following what the world does. You know what's funny? As we look at this list, you see partying, you see sex, and you see um, alcohol. It does kind of seem to be the driving force of of a lot of the world, right? If you go to college campus, that's what it's all about for many of them there. That's what they're using their life for. He says, haven't we wasted enough time doing those foolish things? And he finishes a list with abominable idolatries. These disgusting worship of false gods. We've done enough of that. Do we think, as the people of God, that we can agree that this is not time well spent. When I was younger, my sister was about two or three years old. I guess she must have been three or four years old um, because she was speaking well enough. But my Uncle Joe came to our house. And my Uncle Joe was our favorite uncle for a while. He was just just a great, happy guy around all the time. And he was looking at us and and marveling the fact that we'd grown up so fast and he couldn't believe how old we were and the time had just flown by. And my sister, who's three or four years old, looked at him and says, Joe... You can't fight time. He's like, what did you say? He said, you can't fight time, Joe. (laughs) That's absolutely true. Um, You can't fight time. And our life is going past us. And we're spending it on something. And I I don't know where you're at in your stage of life. Maybe you've lived a lot of your life. Maybe you've got a lot of life ahead of you. But I can guarantee you one thing. You don't want to waste the rest of your life. That time is past. 
But there is time ahead. And he's saying, in your past time, you've wasted enough of it. What you've done in the flesh, it's sufficient. You don't need to do any more of that. It's never going to get better. You're not going to do something that's like, oh, this is the thing I was looking for that satisfies my flesh. It's just not going to happen. And so spend our time to do the will of our Father. Verse number four. Wherein they, and the they are the Gentiles. So the Gentiles that walk in all of those things. They think it strange that you run not with them to the same access of riot speaking evil of you. Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? He says the Gentiles will think that you don't fit in. They will call you a stranger. The word is guest or stranger there. And so you will no longer fit in. Why? Because you, jo- you no longer join them in the same access of riot. And the word is literally a flood of reckless, wasteful living. You no longer join them in just pouring their life out to the lusts of the flesh. And so they're going to look at you and they're going to think, man, this person's strange. They've changed. They're so different. What's up? What's going on? But they, don't just, they won't just allow you to change and not say anything, right? They don't just let their old friend or their old coworker or their neighbor become a different person, become a, a more holy person, a person who loves God, who lives for the will of God without saying anything. No, they're going to slander you. They're going to speak evil of you. They're going to heap abuse on you, malign you, insult or vilify you. You don't just get to change and follow the Lord and think that darkness is going to be all okay with it. If you continue to live among the people that you've lived with and you become light, then the darkness will begin to hate you. That's what happens. And as they take notice, and as they begin to insult and to mock you, you are going to feel this pull back toward them. It is a difficult thing. The question is always in our minds, why is it that Christians seem to to just not be able to live for Christ? I mean, why do we struggle so much? I think one of the reasons we struggle so much is because we desire acceptance. We want to fit in, right? We don't want to be strangers with the world. We want to please everyone. Certainly, all of us would agree we must please our Father. right? We, We want to live to please God, And so our task becomes, how do I live to please God and then please everybody else around me at the same time? How do I live to please God and please myself? Can I do both? What can I get away with? And we ask all these questions that are just the wrong questions. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to serve two masters. And it can't be done. But look how fast in these verses. He says, yes, they're going to vilify you. They're going to call you strangers. They're going to insult you and mock you. But look how fast he reminds us of the judgment of God. And I want to I make the point to say that Peter is not speaking to, to unbelievers. So he's not using this as like, hey, when they do this, you should just like throw in your face. Hey, you're going to hell, right? You're, you're going to be judged by God. That's, that's not Peter's goal here. Peter's goal is to encourage us to continue in living for Christ. And so very quickly he says, um, wherein they that will call you, that think you're strange and will speak evil, evil of you, who, which is the same who, it's the Gentiles, shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. That those people who are vilifying you and insulting you and mocking you will someday stand before the judge of the living and the dead. And they'll give an account. And so you don't need to worry about it. You don't need to change. You don't need to live to please them. Live to please your Father and know that everyone, no matter what they say and what they do for you, will one day stand before him. And they'll give an account. See, it's not our job to to execute vengeance. It's not our job to get equal, to get back. God will make all things right. And so find out that we used to be those people who lived that way. And so we don't look at them and think, oh, they're so awful and terrible and evil. What we do is we look to our Father and we say, God, help me to live for you. And we found in previous passages that when we do that, it's glorifying to God. 
that it helps others to see God and to know him. And so even though they might mock you and even though they might vilify you, they're seeing Christ in you. They're seeing truth. And oftentimes that's what God uses to convert them to Christ. And it's good for you. It's always a good thing for us to follow our Lord. Verse number six. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Here's another verse that is a little bit confusing for us. There are three ways to understand the verse, or at least three primary ways to understand the verse. Two of which might be right, and one of it which I think is right. So I want to give you these three ways. So the, the verse is, for this cause, or for this reason, the gospel was preached to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. What, is, what does Peter mean? Well, first of all, some people say, the gospel was preached to those who are currently dead. So as he's saying, these people have already died, and it's that it was preached to them now while they're dead. This is, this is, I believe, the wrong way of seeing the verse, but a lot of people do see it this way. Some people try, choose to interpret it this way. They say that, this is saying that for this cause, the gospel is preached to those who are already dead currently. It's happening right now. It's as if they get a second chance. So that even though they were judged by man as sinners while they were alive, they might now, even after they've perished, live in their spirit to God. Now, there are three reasons I think this is, this is wrong, incorrect interpretation. The first one is, I think it's biblically flawed. I think that very clearly in Scripture, the Bible does not present the case for God giving those who have died without Christ a second chance. It, the Bible talks about there being death and then judgment. After this, the judgment. Okay? God's mercies are new. His mercies are great. But there is a time of, of salvation, and there is a time when grace is no longer offered, right? And sometimes we like to blow up God's love and God's kindness and God's grace to mean that, that he is just going to eventually win. Like love is just going to win over everybody and it's going to reach every soul, even at the darkest pit of hell. And that's, that's not justice. We lose God's holiness and God's justice. Right? God gives sinners time to repent, but not an endless time. And so it's biblically flawed, There are many places in the Bible that make it clear that you live once and there is judgment. The second reason is I think it's chronologically flawed because you notice that it was the gospel was preached, was past tense to them that are dead. And so it's not that it is being preached to those who are dead or that it will be preached to those who are dead. So it'd be weird to say, well, at one point, the gospel was going to go back and be preached to those who are dead, but it's not a continuing thing. And the verb here is not continual, it's past tense. And so it doesn't make sense, the argument, um, in the, chronologically. And finally, I think it's logically flawed. I think that if we are trying to follow what Peter is saying, he's trying to encourage those who might have to suffer for Christ. And it would be weird for him to be encouraging them and say, don't worry, God is going to judge them, but then to turn around and say, but, but when they're dead, he's going to preach to them so that maybe they can come alive again. That, that, that doesn't really make sense, Right? It seems like what he's trying to do in verse 5, he's just going to, trying to say, you don't need to worry, God will make all things right. And in verse 6, um, somehow should naturally flow from that. And saying that God is going to give those sinners that are um, maligning them a second chance doesn't flow. So that's the wrong way of looking at it, I believe. The second way that is often looked at, and it's a possible way, I don't think it's right, but I, I think it's possible, is for this cause was the gospel preached unto them who are dead spiritually, right? So it spiritualizes them being dead. So they're not physically dead yet. The gospel was preached to those who were dead spiritually so that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. And so what it's saying is, and it has to change that. It has to make that change where it's all of a sudden we're talking about spiritualizing this rather than just that they're dead. Um, and, And it's possible. Because it's possible that the gospel is being preached to those who are dead spiritually. Why? So that they can be judged by man, but they can be alive unto God. That's a possible interpretation. The problems I think it faces is that the past tense of was was preached still doesn't make sense. That it was preached, but it it should be is being preached or will be preached. is a continual thing to those who are dead spiritually. 
Um, and it spirit, spiritualizes the dead unnecessarily. So my way, or the third way of interpreting this, would be, for this cause was the gospel preached unto them who are dead, them being the believers who have died, possibly martyrs. Okay? So for this cause, the gospel was preached to them who have died as believers or who have died as martyrs, so that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but alive according to God in the Spirit. The reason this makes most sense to me is because I think it makes most sense of his argument. What he's, what he's trying to say, he's saying, the gospel was preached to those who have gone before you, the brothers and sisters who have maybe even given their lives before you. And, and now, yes, they were judged by man in the flesh, just like you're being judged by man, just like men are looking at you and maligning you, and maybe even putting you to death. There are others that have gone before you and gone through the same thing, but this is their ending. This is their case. They're alive according to God in the Spirit. And so even those who have gone through what you're going through in the past, maybe even died for it, they are now alive according to God in the Spirit. I think it it fits Peter's argument. It doesn't spiritualize unnecessarily, and it makes sense of the tense. Right? It's, it's, it was preached to those who were dead. That, that flows. So that, that's how I would see it. Now, how do we apply this text to our lives? I think we've done some of that already. Um, The message title tonight is Choose Your Judge and Live Accordingly. Choose your judge and live accordingly. The truth is, what we see here is that all are judged by all. We will be judged by man. We will be judged by God. What Peter's encouraging them to do is to choose which judge they're going to please. Which judge are you going to live your life for? And so tonight what I want to do in the last few moments here is pit man as a judge versus God as a judge and see whom we should live for. And and hopefully you see that the stakes are kind of already in God's favor. So this is kind of a, a, a... I'm just kind of setting this up because we already know what the ending is, but I think it might be helpful for us to go through it and really see just what the two options look like. Because as much as it's silly when you put it that way, like should you, should you live for God, that you're going to stand for God one day, or do you think it's more important that you live to please your next door neighbor? Right? You think in those, that sense, and you go, it'd be crazy for me to live for my next door neighbor. The problem is, in practice, far too many of us live for our next door neighbor, or at least at times do. Or at times, are just trying to do both. And so let's pit your next door neighbor or your coworker or your friend at school against God and see who we should really live to please. First, is this a legitimate issue? Do we need to choose? Because a lot of Christians, and even being taught today in churches, that you should be living to please God and... And everybody else. You want to make everybody happy. Everybody should like you. Right? If, if people hate you, it's probably because you're just doing something in, in an unkind way. I think the answer is yes. I think we do need to choose. And I'll sh- share some verses with you. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10 says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul is being very clear in his letter to the Galatians that he had the choice to persuade men or God. He had the choice to please men or God. But if he chose to please men with his life, he would not be serving Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2, chapter 4, Paul writes, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. Ephesians 6, 6 says, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. How, how do we live, and this is specifically talking about how do we live in our job, in our place of employment, or as servants to our employers? Not with eye service, not, not as pleasing men, not as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ. You see those are are juxtaposed one against the other constantly in Scripture. We please men or we please God. James 4.4, friendship of the world is enmity with God. In Acts 
Should we obey God or should we obey man? So we do need to make that conscious decision. I think the problem is not that we don't know what the right answer is. The problem is we're not consciously making that decision all the time. We're just, we're just letting ourselves live and hoping that at the end of the, the, the day we've pleased God and not man. But when we do that, when we fail to actually consciously, purposefully serve God and do the will of God and to please God, oftentimes we slip back into this pleasing of men because that's what our culture expects us to do. That's what they tell us to do. And so who are we accountable to? Um, As a kid, I remember having school projects and during the projects, we would have to work as a group. So it was this big group project. Maybe you had five people in your group and at the end of the project, the teacher would not give you a mark what would happen is the other four group members would give you a mark based on how they thought you performed in the group. I hated these projects. I really did. Because what happens? I mean, are all of these other people in your group really worried about whether you were um, putting sufficient amount of study into the project, whether you were grammatically correct in the sentences that you were providing with the group or or that you were doing your share? No, what, what they cared about is, do they like you? Right? Did you make them feel good while you were going through the project? Did you say nice things about the things that they said or they did? Did we all get along well? Right? Were you popular? Those were the things that mattered to everybody else, right? And so I would much rather have a teacher objectively look at our project and say, you did good, you didn't. And that's what happens, right? We, we get this mentality where it's like everybody is our judge. And that's not the right mentality. We have a judge. And so, who are we accountable to? Who will you please? Judge number one is mankind. As soon as I think about this statement, mankind as judge, I think back to the time of the judges when every man did what was right in their own eyes. How did that work out? Mankind as their own judge. Debauchery, violence, idol worship just begins to describe the society. And what happened is, they would get so sinful that they would be brought into bondage by another nation because God would judge them, and they'd have to cry out for deliverance. But this is what happened over and over and over again. So when man is their own judge, they are terrible at it. Mankind is finite. We are limited in every possible way. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 22. This is King David speaking. And so if there's any man who we can look to and say, man, that guy's impressive. He's a man after God's own heart. We heard that this morning, right? This guy is king of Israel, king of God's nation, chosen by God. He said, Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. So one of the greatest men that have ever lived say, there's, God, there's nobody like you. There's no, nobody beside you. There's nobody can compare with you. There's nothing. Our power is limited by time and by extent. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear them which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So Jesus looked at the people who were the strongest in the nation, who had the ability to say a word and have your life taken. I don't think there's, there's much more power than that. I think there's many people who would say that the epitome of power is being able to say, you're dead, and then you die. You're killed. And he says, don't fear those people that have that much power. Why? Because their power is limited by time. All they can do is kill you once, and then that's it. And by extent, they can only kill your body. You should fear the one that can kill your body and your soul. (laughs) Put you in hell forever. That's who we should fear. And so we are limited by time and by extent. Our thinking is limited. So our power is limited. Our thinking is limited. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 9. Isaiah writes, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is pretty clear here whose thoughts are worth listening to. Our hearts are deceitful. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. This is, this is mankind. So if we want to set up mankind as a judge. Let's just be clear about who we're setting up. We're setting up the one 
setting up someone who is far less great than God, one who is limited power in their time and their extent, even if you find the most powerful, they're very limited, someone whose thinking is limited and whose heart is deceitful. Mankind is limited, but not only is mankind limited as a judge, as anything, mankind is evil. Romans 7.18, the Apostle Paul says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. And while we're in Romans, why don't we look at Romans chapter 1, verses 28 to 32. Paul writes, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. This is Paul's condemnation of all mankind. And he says, this is who they are. They're all these sins. They're, all these, they're sinners of all stripes and all sizes and all shapes. And he says, and these people, they don't just have pleasure in the sin that they do, but they have pleasure in others who they can get to do those things to. So you want to set those people up as your judge? Go for it. You want to live to please them? Your flesh already wants to do it, so you'll just naturally do it if you don't walk out of here making a conscious decision not to. Romans 3, verses 10 to 19. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all together gone out of the way. They are become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Verse number 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, men want to set themselves up as judges. We want to set ourselves up even as gods. But this is the truth here. We are all gone out of the way, and all of us, are guilty before the law of God. C.S. Lewis says about wanting to be God, but falling so short. He says, A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling darkness on the wall of his cell. That's it. We, We sit there before God, and mankind sits here before God, and we say, God, we're going to judge you. And God laughs. What a joke. How limited we are. How sinful we are. And someday, every tongue that laughs at God, and every finger that points at God and says, you're dead, or I judge you, or you're not my God, will bow before Jesus Christ. Mankind is not a good judge. Option number two, God is our judge. God is infinite. His power is infinite. Jesus said, with man this is impossible. With God all things are possible. And so God is the God of the impossible. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 10 to 13 says, But the Lord is the one true God. He is the living God, an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall you say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power, 
He has established the world by his wisdom, and he has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with his rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. What Jeremiah is trying to say there is that God is all-powerful, and he can do anything. Anytime he wants, the, the rain, the wind, all of it, the lightning, it's all under his control, under his command. So this is the God we should have as our judge. God is a God of infinite power. He's a God of infinite wisdom. Romans 11, verses 33 to 36 was preached about at the conference we were at. And it was just, it, just phenomenal verses about who God is. It says, Oh, the depth and the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways to pass finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has for first given to him and shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. God is so far beyond our understanding. He's so much greater than we can even fathom. We can't imagine just a tip of the glory and the greatness of God. This is who God is. Who has ever given him a gift that that he had to pay them back? There's nothing we can give to God. There's nothing we can offer to God where he'd be like, oh yeah, now I owe you. He never owes anybody anything. Nobody can ever give him counsel. Nobody can ever help him. Right? He's just too great. John Wesley said... Bring me a worm that can comprehend a man, and I will show you a man that can comprehend the triune God. That is what we are before God, a worm. As a worm is to a man. And, 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 I mean, you're not going to find an analogy that can comprehend, that can make sense of us compared to infinite. Infinitely wise, infinitely powerful. This is who God is. And not only is God infinite, but God is good. God is good. As as wicked and evil as man is, God is good. Abraham in Genesis 18, 25 says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the answer is overwhelmingly yes. The God of the whole earth will do right because he is a good God. Psalm 145, verses 5 to 9 says, I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness, and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. And so who do you want your judge to be? Evil, wicked, finite mankind, or the infinitely powerful and wise, good God, who is full of goodness and mercy and love and grace and compassion and forgiveness. This is our God. It was mankind who was so evil that they would take the creator of the universe and nail him to a cross. And it was the infinite, powerful creator of the universe that went to the cross willingly for our sakes. So who do you want your judge to be? Over and above all of this, over and above all of looking at his power and his character compared to ours, the fact remains, you're only going to stand before God. And so even if all of this wasn't true, the answer would be, do I want to live to please the, God, the, the person, the thing, the creator that I'm going to stand before, or to please somebody I'm never going to stand before? Because what's, what's so crazy in all of this is that oftentimes we live our lives to be judged by somebody who's not even a judge. And we do have the real judge that will one day stand before. And God is the only one that matters. Peter knew that, his, that the people that he was writing to would face difficulties. What's incredible in the book of 1 Peter is that they're in this transition period where at first it was like Christianity was this new, exciting thing. Um, A lot of the pagans, a lot of the Gentiles thought that it was the same as Judaism or just a branch of Judaism. So there was some protection afforded to them. 
But Peter is writing this letter during the time when that protection was starting to wane. He's writing this letter when persecution was just beginning. Now, at this point, not that many people were giving their lives for Christ. Not that many people were being persecuted unto death. Now, some had, but not that many, especially the people he's writing to. It seems like Peter's referring and is talking about the persecution that is more similar to what we face than we might expect. Where their culture was turning against them. Their culture was one of living for the flesh, denying the existence of God, or if you, if you have a God, you create a God in your image that wants you to do the things that please you. This, is, this was the situation they were in. What they were going to lose was their friends, their family, possibly, their jobs, possibly. But they, weren't, they were looking at being maligned and insulted, and, and at this point, probably not killed. And so Peter's writing to people that aren't in a really dissimilar situation than we are. And this is his message for them. He says, quit living for the desires of the Gentiles. Prepare yourself to live like your Savior. We have wasted enough time on sinful endeavors. It is time for us to live for the Lord. It's time for us, God's people, to live for his will. When the world turns against you, remind yourself that one day we will all stand before God. Those who hate you and persecute you will die in their sins. Remember those who have died holding on to the truth and are now alive in God. Know that someday living for God will not be wasted. Someday you'll stand before God and and you won't want to stand before him saying, God, sorry, I wasted all the time that you had given me. All of those moments just wasted on ourselves, on pleasing others. We will want to get to the end of our lives and say, God, I did my best to live for you. And so you have an uncertain amount of time left in your life. And you choose every moment who you're going to live to please. I think what Peter's telling us is, we should live to please the judge of the universe. Let's pray.